Hello and welcome to another episode of Pakistanomy. My name is Uzair Yunus and today I have the honor of hosting Dr. Nilofar Siddiqui, who is assistant professor at the University of Albany. She's also a non-resident fellow at the Stimson Center and a fellow at the Mehbubul Haq Center at LUMS. Um, and the reason we have here, her here today is to talk about her research and her book, Under the Gun, Political Parties and Violence in Pakistan, which examines why political parties in the country engage in violence and the variation in the strategies they employ to use violence as a tool to achieve their aims. Um, it's something that you know we often talk about uh, related to parties in Karachi in particular with the MQM back in the day or with the TLP increasingly today. And in fact, even Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Imran Khan in a recent speech saying he called off his protest in Islamabad because he saw his political party workers had weapons there and he feared that there would be bloodshed. So it's something that, you know, has been a violence has been a tool that has been used by parties going back decades in Pakistan and all over the world. And Dr. Siddiqui's research has looked at this topic at a very in-depth level in Pakistan. So Dr. Siddiqui, welcome to Pakistanomy and thank you for taking out the time today. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm really excited to be here. I feel like I'm like been like a long time listener, first time caller situation. So I'm excited yeah. that you asked uh, me to come. I am thrilled that you're here. And let's just <laughs> jump right in, right? It's something that, you know, you open up the newspapers in Pakistan or listen to political talk shows or drawing room conversations. And Pakistanis often talk about that political parties of whatever type are violent and something should be done about it. You've done research on this topic. So first tell us, uh, help the listener understand like what are the the tools that they employ uh, why is violence a, a sort of strategy that these political parties employ and, and what have you seen in your research yeah sure so maybe i can start by explaining like why i became interested in this topic um so i started my phd i think uh, back in 2011 now um and uh, I had been in Pakistan for the previous couple of years prior to applying for the PhD. And, uh, you know, at that time, violence in Karachi was um, at very high levels, right, as you will recall. And so I applied for the PhD. And when I got there, I knew I wanted to study Pakistan. Um, and I became really interested in this question about why we have these high levels of violence in Karachi. And why is it primarily in Karachi? Why do some parties like the MQM, as you noted, you know, employ violence directly? Why do they have these party cadres who seem to be engaging in violence? Why do some other political parties seem to outsource this task to uh, criminal gangs or ethnic militias? Why do some parties who have, you know, um, non-violence non as their ideology in other parts of the country seem to employ these tools like the ANP, right, in, in Karachi during a certain period of time? And then I also started to think about violence more broadly, right? So in Pakistan, we have violence of all types, like sectarian violence, um, Islamist violence, um, separatist violence, and so on. And so um, I also started to think about when political parties will engage in what seem like electoral alliances with, um, with some of these, these groups, right? So at that time, also, there was this picture that became quite um, you know, viral on social media of the then Punjab law minister campaigning with the head of a banned um, anti-Shia militant um, group, right? And so- and, and, and sorry to interrupt for those of you who are not aware of this full context, he's currently interior minister of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, Rana Sanaullah is who you're talking about. Right, so this picture went viral. Um, and then there were examples of when uh, political parties like the PPP in the 1990s, but then the PMLN more recently, in, you know, bringing on, it seemed, to contest elections, actors who were allegedly affiliated with these groups. Um, and so I became interested in, in why these strategies were being employed. You know, so why, um, if, if the party's primary reason is to gain uh, political power, right, which we can assume that they want to win elections, that are their, they might have other goals, but that's their primary goal. So then why would they engage in acts that might seem like they would be unpopular with voters, right? So how do voters react to these um, and then why are we seeing this type of variation, right? So, so I, I think of direct violence, um, outsourcing of violence and alliances with violence specialists as distinct outcomes. And then when I was doing my PhD, you know, I, I started to think more comparatively. And as you noted, um, you know, party violence isn't new and party violence is certainly not restricted to Pakistan. So since 1945, cross-national data shows that um, almost 20% of national elections around the world have seen significant violence involving civilian deaths. Um, and then on, on the African continent, um, again, other researchers have found that electoral violence is now one of the most common forms of violence um, 
occurring. And so, and, and then we have examples of parties like the Shiv Sena in Mumbai engaging in, um, you know, direct forms of violence, which are often interlinked with economic um, gain as well. And then we have parties in Kenya um, and Nigeria outsourcing violence to various ethnic militias and criminal gangs as well. So this was certainly not a Pakistan only phenomenon, but that's basically what got me interested um, in, in this broader question. And so you started looking at, at this stuff and I'm guessing you started with Karachi because that was the driving force and then you start digging deeper. So what did you uncover as you sort of got into the how and why and the rationale all these actors used to, to employ violence as a tool? Yeah, so I think of, um, you know, as I mentioned, violence as falling on a spectrum, right? And I identify parties engaging in violence directly, by which I mean that the act of violence is carried out by a party member itself, by party cadre. Um, and then I um, conceive of uh, party outsourcing, where the party um, will delegate the task, let's say, to a distinct actor, but the party itself is not really getting its hands dirty. And then the third is uh, of these electoral alliances. So here, the party doesn't benefit per se from the act of violence itself, but nonetheless will um, engage in um, either seat adjustments or campaign alongside with or bring to contest on their party ticket um, actors who might be engaged in violence themselves. And so what I wanted to think about was I, I thought of parties as, um, you know, I thought of party violence as being partly about incentives, right? And I can think of incentives as both the benefit that you gain from violence, as well as the cost you incur from violence, and then separately party capacity to engage in violence, right? So let me walk through the incentives first. So when I think, when we think of incentives, we have to think about what is the party gaining from this act, right? Whether it's direct violence, outsourcing, or alliance. And to, for that, I, I, we have to think, I think first, like you said about Karachi, right? And so what is it about Karachi that makes the act of violence something that so many political parties um, up till about 2016, right? Like really engaged in as just the repertoire of their strategies in this mega city. And so I started to think a little bit about um, the way in which state capacity manifests at the um, subnational level. And so we know that you know, state capacity in Pakistan is generally weak, but state capacity as it manifests in parts of rural Pakistan is different from the way it manifests in Karachi. So for example, in, in many parts of the country, we know that um, there are these feudal actors, um, landed elites um, and other forms of electables who really do control um, for all intents and purposes, um, the parts of, parts of that parts of this constituency, let's say, right? And so by control, I mean, you know, that they, um, the many voters will vote according to um, what they think the local electable, their local patron thinks is a good idea, uh, but also that the party knows that if they want to win in this constituency, that they kind of need to bring the electable on board. Um, and then, you know, lots of evidence shows that, and, and my interviews also corroborated this, that, you know, the police are often um, you know, not willing to um, you know, go into these areas if it means, you know, butting heads with the local electable. Um, the local electables often have their own, like in some in some areas, have their own, you know, local militia, for lack of a better word, but that they do control for all intents and purposes, like the monopoly of violence in a small area. And so for parties, often who are weakly organized, for them to win there, they need to bring this person on board. And so in Karachi, though, which also has weak state capacity, it manifests differently. And so a lot of people have written about this. Lauren Gaier writes about this in, in his fantastic book, right? But he says it's Karachi has for a long time suffered from the inability of any one actor to become the hegemon, right? And so he says for a period of time, we have the MQM doing so. But in general, it really is what I call like a, 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 an arena of multiple competing sovereigns. And so the state capacity is very different there. And so I suggest that what happens is that the um, because of this lack of state capacity, the incentives for violence are, are distinct in Karachi. And so the lack of state capacity manifests not only in security, but also in the uh, realm of the informal economy. And so that's why we have a lot of economic gain um, that occurs through control of land, right? Um, through uh, con like turf wars that we talked about, Kabza politics, bhatta and extortion and all of this. And so the, the political actor actually has a lot to gain from physical control of the city, right? And so it's not just from um, winning elections, but the winning of elections where it, when it is paired with this physical control. And so you have this economic, um, this possibility of economic gain 
which interlinks with violence, which again, a lot of other people have written about. Um, and, and um, you know, like a lot of activists have talked about this as well. And so this really increases the, um, the incentives for violence in Karachi um, for the political actors who are involved. And then in the in, in other areas, right, where we have these local electables, what increases in terms of the incentives for alliances with these actors is the ability or the desire to win that seat. And so the political party, as we know, right, so many political parties, weekly organized parties from the PPP, PMLN to the PTI have chosen to bring on board local electables. Sometimes these local electables are violent, right? And so what we're seeing is that in some of these districts and constituencies throughout, especially South Punjab, but also increasingly in Sin, that we have sectarian actors who are becoming increasingly influential. Um, I'm not gonna say that they're like necessarily re replacing the feudal elite completely, but they're certainly challenging the feudal elite, right? And so they're the ones who start to control the local vote bank. And so when they start to control the local vote bank, the, the political party who's weakly organized and wants to win a seat will, will engage in the same sort of um, strategy as they would with like a local feudal actor as they have historically done. Right. And so we have this also influx of money. Um, we have all the regional considerations as to why sectarian influence has increased um, in, in the region. So not not to discount that. Right. But to think about like why at the local level, the political party is still is still motivated. Um, and so that's the incentive side. And then we want to think about the cost. Right. So why in Karachi did voters not hold parties accountable for the use of violence? And so this, I, I argue, is about um, ethnic polarization, right? And so again, this is also a concept that a lot of political scientists have written about, but we had a very ethnically polarized um, time period in Karachi. And some would, I mean, some would argue that it's continuing. Things have changed a little bit, right, since 2016, but for about 30 years, people really voted um, for their co-ethnic political party. And so even after the operation against the MQM in 1997, um, you know, I have I have a, a stack of Herald magazines from the last 20 years, um, and I was looking over some of these, and the 1997, I think July cover was about like book called Return of the Death Squads, about how the MQM was kind of going back to its old uh, use of violence. And I, I remember one of the quotes from that was that, and it said that a lot of Mohajers are actually kind of really sick and tired of the violence that the party has employed, but they don't really see an, an exit option, that if they don't vote for the MQM, then their interests are not going to be um, met. And so we have what ends up being a captive support base, right? So the party knows, um, and all the ethnic political parties know, that really as long as politics here are polarized to this extent, they can count on the support of their core co-ethnic vote bank. Right. And so as long as they do that, they're really unlikely to suffer a lot of um, cost at the polls, because ultimately, because because politics is so ethnically divided that the Mohajir voter is going to vote for the MQM, the Sindhi voter is going to vote for the PPP and so on. And so the cost of violence in a place like Karachi during this period, right, was really minimal which gave the parties the ability to gain from the incentives of violence in this uh, multiple uh, sovereign weak state capacity arena in Karachi, and also not have to really suffer the cost for, for it. And then in the other areas, um, in, in many parts of South Punjab, for example, the parties had the incentive to ally with the local electable or patron, regardless of whether they were violent or not. And because they were the local patron um, and they provided these um, you know, the, the goods and services, um, access to state services, which you need this person to access state services, Tana Kucheri, you know, local law and order, whatever. Uh, without that, it's really impossible to like live life, right, in a lot of these areas. And so um, they also had a captive support bank, right, for all intents and purposes. And then, and then finally, um, the other key variable that I look at is, is organizational capacity, right? So if these parties were stronger um, in, in parts of rural Punjab or Sindh or wherever, then they wouldn't really need to rely on these actors, right? But it's really the fact is that these parties have weak organizational capacity. Um, and this is again, distinct from the MQM, which had very strong organizational capacity, which is exactly why it was able to engage in violence directly. It didn't need to outsource it. It, it, contained, it contained within the party, the violence specialist, right? And it had um, a chain of command. It has socialization procedures, right? Lots of people have written about these really intense socialization in the initiations almost, right? Of the, of the members of the, of the party. And so they were able to engage in, you know, what is, what is 
uh, uh, the difficult act of violence, right? So anybody engaging in violence is, is going to, you know, potentially be killed in the process. It might go against their their morals. It's um, you're going to face issues with the law enforcement. It's not an easy act to engage in, right? So you really do need these initiation proceedings or the socialization procedure or whatever it is, and this big uh, reverence and a devotion to the leader of al Hussein, right? And so all of that was necessary for the MQM to engage in direct party violence in a very different way than the outsourcing of other parties to like the People's Summon Committee um, and so on. So I can, yeah. I can stop here. No, this is fabulous. And, and I, I'm glad you brought up People's Summon Committee because I was going to say that it's also like an ironic name, right? The People's Peace Committee was an actor that was, you know, conducting violent acts and engaged in a war, essentially a tough war with the MQM at that time. The one question I have on this, I think it applies to both the rural side of things where there are electables, um, as well as to a place like Karachi, is that, um, and I would love your thoughts on this, is the incentives to engage in acts of violence also then help minimize the cost, right? In the case of the MQM, the gains they made territorially, economically, politically, then allowed them to say, even in a constituency where voters were sick and tired of them, on election day, they could stuff ballots, right? Or if they, if people were sick and tired of giving money to the MQM on Bakraid, they could forcibly get the, the, the hides of the cows and the goats to raise their money, right? And then Altaf Hussain would very proudly say, oh, look, we raised a record amount of money. Whereas those who lived in Karachi knew that this was extortion. Um, that many people were not doing this out of their free will, but the, as you said, there was no other way out of this. They were captive to that to that violent actor. Um, and then on the flip side, in, similar to the feudal uh, or sort of the rule example you gave, in the Karachi example, then it's also that, oh, you're better off going to the sector commander and being friends with him um, if you need a new water connection or your gas line is broken and the local sort of authorities are not being responsive. And that's also similar to the Tana Kacheri culture. The electable has been replaced by an organized MQM with a sector exactly. commander office, right? Um, so then my question is, how do you get out of this? And it, it be, you know, in Karachi, obviously, there was a big military, paramilitary operation. But generally speaking, is that the only way out of this sort of situation or are there other things that can perhaps evolve and lead to the weakening of these actors? Yeah, I mean, so that's a great question, but let me just emphasize one point that you, you made right now. And I think this is very important to me that my research show that voters are not being irrational at some level, right? Like, I think it's a very rational act the way that you're, you're describing it, that um, you're going to have to get your needs met somewhere in, in a system that is flawed, right? In a state that is largely absent uh, or a state that is largely corrupt or, or what have you. And so for them, it made it made sense. And it, it, I don't want it to seem also that voters don't care about violence or that they like violence, right? It's not really about that. It's about like looking at the choices in front of you and thinking, okay, well, um, this violence isn't affecting me. Um, it, let's say in the case of, if you're okay with a sectarian, actor or cleric, right, in parts of rural Punjab, for example, you could be like, okay, well, the feudal uh, was both economically dominant over me and also maybe wielded some sort of coercion. And this sectarian actor also kind of fits my um, spiritual need, fulfills my spiritual needs, um, also is directing violence outward rather than at me. So it's like a rational choice, right, just as it was a rational choice for ethnic um, uh, you know, pe people of different ethnicities to vote for their co-ethnics because of this link, right, between uh, clientelism and ethnicity and the ways in which political and social life in Karachi was largely organized along along ethnicity. So I think that's I think that's that's absolutely right. Um, and, you know, as for how parties get out of this dynamic or how cities get out of this dynamic, you know, what's really interesting about the PTI because um, you know the PTI now is obviously a topic of much discussion. Um, but what's interesting about the way it manifested, I think, in Karachi is that it actually ended up providing a really viable non-ethnic third option, right? And so if we think about these voters as being captive at some level to their co-ethnic parties, what we have with the introduction of the PTI is a party that's actually trying, and I think to some extent succeeding, in appealing across ethnic lines, right? And so a lot of newspaper articles after the 2018 elections, right, did talk about the post-ethnic elections in Karachi, right? And so not, not and we, we can talk about like the, the operation against the MQM in a second, but just also to think about just 
the role of the voter, which is what I try to emphasize in my book. And so think about the options that are presented to the voter. They've seen you know, three decades of, of, of violence on and off, right? And we've, they've seen parties uh, organized along ethnic lines. And now we have a party that's coming in and saying like, oh, I'm gonna appeal to any of you, it doesn't matter. And I'm gonna, I'm going to, whether you're Mahajir or Sindhi or whatnot, um, vote for us, right? And I think, you know, the the out, um, voter turnout among Mohajirs was certainly much lower than previous years. So I'm not discounting that. But many Mohajirs did see for the first time a real exit option, right? And so I think that that was, um, that was important. And the sorry world. to interrupt here. The one thing I would also add to this, I, and I agree with you, was that the declining status of, status of Altaf Hussain sort of was at this happening at the same time as Imran Khan's own popularity right. was growing as an individual leader as well. Yeah, no, I think that's very true, especially when we think about the role of charismatic leaders, right? In the case of both Altaf and Imran, I think that's absolutely right. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, I think the role, some of the criticism I sometimes get for, from uh, people who have read parts of my book, or if I describe my book, is like, well, you're focusing on the parties too much, right? What about the other societal actors or state actors? And I definitely, again, don't want to minimize the role of these other actors. Like, you know, in Pakistan, the, the parameters of, of the ways in which party act or the party strategies or whatever, are, are, are the boundaries within which parties must operate are, are not of the, the party's own decision, right? So parties face short-term horizons. They don't know if they're going to have elections as planned five years from now, or whether they're going to have to contest elections again in three years, right? And this, of course, affects the way in which parties operate, right? The fact that sectarian actors are available as potential allies is not something that the parties created, right? This is like a lot of other state decisions and regional decisions and, and international factors that create these parameters within which parties operate. So that's that's certainly the case. And I think in this case, we saw, you know, what I think of as an external shock, right? We saw very high levels of violence and, and, and other um, political reasons why the MQM was cracked down upon, right? And so we had this very harsh crackdown happening at the same time as we saw this rise of this post not post-ethnic option necessarily, but like cross-ethnic or non-ethnic option. And so this, this, these two dual events, I think, allowed for an opening, which allowed for a, a change in, um, in Karachi politics. But, you know, whether or not this is going to continue, I think, is an open question. And I think that what's really important, um, again, even as I talk about party violence, is that parties, um, voters desire representation, right? They have all sorts of needs that that are, are valid and need to be met. Um, and so the MQM, you know, for all its faults and its use of violence, I like, did provide to a very sizable percentage of Karachi's population both um, both descriptive representation, which was important, right, and and pride and everything else that comes with it, as well as material needs, right. And so I think just getting rid of that option. Um, is not going to, I think, get rid of um, some of the underlying issues which are still at stake. And so I'm not, I think, I think it definitely remains an open question as to like how this continues, but it seems very likely to me that we're not seeing like an end of ethnic politics in Karachi, right? I don't, I don't think there is, I think as voters become, and some are exhibiting it now, like becoming disgruntled with the PTI, there'll be a desire among some communities for a return of the MQM. Yeah, and I think um, even at sort of, if one were to say 2018 was sort of the bottom for the MQM in terms of its political power and influence, even at that point, without its support, there would be no PTI coalition, right? And we saw in April that okay. once the MQM said, Khudaf is, the whole car came, the, the whole government came crumbling down because they still have that enough seats to command that power. And where does that go in the next election cycle is to be seen. But one would argue right. that 2018 in recent memory was the big low for the MQM and still is a relevant national actor uh, when it comes to parliamentary democracy in Pakistan. The one thing that we've seen emerge recently, you mentioned the use of the, the role of other state actors and obviously the TLP has emerged as, as sort of you know a group that has exercised violence, not the type the MQM uses, but again, command a presence on the street, riot, destroy property, bring a lockdown in Punjab and Karachi and other urban parts. Um, how do you see the evolution of that group uh, moving forward? And the one reason why I particularly ask you this question today, for example, is, you know, I'm eagerly watching uh, 
um, and concerned about what the TLT does in light of the comments made by a BJP spokesman in India, which has caused an uproar, rightfully so, across the Muslim world. And the TLT has in the past weaponized a topic like this. Um, and so again, it's a, it's a group that the government fears, I would say, perhaps fears more than the MQM even because the MQM didn't get the types of deals that TLP does um, and has had at times like release of Saad Rizvi, et cetera. So how do you see the emergence of this new actor on the political map and the way it's exercising violence? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm really fascinated by the rise of the TLP as I know many observers and scholars of Pakistan are. I'll be honest and say at this point with the TLP, I have more questions than I do answers, right? Um, in part because I COVID has prevented as much travel uh, to Pakistan as I would have liked over the past two or three years, which has seen, you know, kind of the rise of the TLP. But I think for, you know, what I'm particularly interested in is, is thinking about the way in which the TLP becomes organized, right? As whether it is, and there's some news that suggests that it is like becoming organized right at the local level in a way that's more akin to the MQM and less akin to kind of like an amorphous political or social movement right sorry to interrupt you here again with the MQM point the stream of consciousness it's something also that Pakistan is urbanizing especially Punjab absolutely so that weak capacity dynamic we saw weak state capacity dynamic in Karachi there will be five ten more types of Karachi maybe mini Karachis yeah. where the TLP may have more influence and actually that's also like that also I think the, the urbanization of Pakistan is also something I think about when I think about the rise of these sectarian local actors, right? Because we actually see them happening in the most urbanizing of, of constituencies, right? So you have the very rural areas, you still have like the feudal elite, right? And in the urban areas, you have different dynamics. And it's really in these urbanizing areas where biradery linkages are becoming more segmented, where the economic dominance of the feudal is like kind of falling apart a little bit, where, um, you know, where, where there is this room for people to, to, to come in and fill that gap is also where you're seeing, I think, the most um, the the ASWJ type um, um, members affiliated with that who are contesting elections are are, are the most uh, the most effective there as well. So yeah, I think urbanization is actually a really interesting trend um, that's happening, and I think we'll kind of determine who the local elites are, right, and how voters react to them. But yeah, so with the TLP, you know, what's what's interesting also is I I think. I guess a couple of open questions that I would keep an eye on in the future is one, how its organizational structure takes root, right? Whether it becomes um, this, I mean, MQM was only in Karachi. That kind of allowed it, just like Shiv Sena is only in Mumbai, right? Like as it goes, as it as the Shiv Sena, for example, tries to go in the rest, tries to become more prominent in the rest of the state, um, you have, you, it is getting hard for them to replicate their organizational capability, right? And so at the MQM also was really at some point was like, okay, we're just a party in Karachi and we're just a party for the Mohajers. And that allowed it to maintain its organizational strength. Now, if the TLP is able to like replicate that in many um, organizational centers around the country, then that I think really raises important questions about the means um, and the capacity for violence in which it can engage in. On the other hand, if it, if it stays kind of rather this like movement that is um, primarily focused on this one issue area of blasphemy and sees its role as partly winning some seats, sure, but really about bringing people out on the streets um, and lobbying for, um, for, for change, right, at the policy level around this one issue, then I think we're going to see slightly different phenomenon, right? And I, I'm not sure exactly which one we'll see. I think it's kind of still early days. Um, I could really see either happening, though I do think like the bar for organizational capacity in multiple places around Pakistan is, is really quite high, right? Um, but I think nonetheless, though, we are seeing, we, we may see that mainstream political parties need to engage in some sort of alliance with the TLP, right? If it's like, okay, well, it has seats here, so we need to bring it on board. If we want to win in this constituency, or it has a lot of local support here, then we got to do something, whether it's appease them or let them carry out their business and turn a blind eye to the violence or whatever. And so you might, I, don't, I, I, I think as an actor that's here to stay, unfortunately, and I do think that political parties, the mainstream political parties will kind of have to figure out where and how they see themselves uh, positioned to the TLP. Yeah, and I think the alliance making is something I'm interested in watching for the next election cycle, mainly because it can really play the role of a spoiler, right? Where particularly with the right of center PTI with its narrative and the PMLN with its historical narrative, and if the Bareilly vote gets split among those two and then some to the TLP, becomes a very difficult equation um, for either party to win out in, right? And you never know where that's going to go. The one thing where perhaps 
uh, your two scenarios, I would lean towards the more organizational one is because the Bareilly school of thought is there across the Punjab and in parts of urban Sindh uh, in particular. And that in and of itself provides some base level organizational capabilities, which is what we've seen in terms of this group's ability to mobilize so quickly, right? I remember the last protest wave that happened, there were just WhatsApp messages coming left, right, and center that they were using to organize. And these are, you know, ideally not political groups or on WhatsApp, these are just, you know, what they do every Thursday or Friday night for their sermonization, um, for their engagement at the community level. And all of a sudden that was weaponized. Um, yeah. Right. So they have some base level capacity that perhaps compared to the MQM or even the ANP is higher because MQM was only ethnic in a particular part of the country, whereas Bareilliism is spread um, in many other parts. But again, we don't know where, where that's going to go, but it would be interesting to see what happens. The one other. Can I, go ahead. Can I just say one thing? I think I think that's totally fair. I think we should just be careful. I don't I'm not saying that you mean this, but like in my research, I think about this a lot, too, is this like ideology. Um, it doesn't always win votes, right? And so if religious ideology or political ideology or whatever. And so I think they would have, there would also be like a disruption. We would need a disruption of the patron client relations as they exist in many of these areas. Um, and so, and I think that that comes with urbanization and other things, right? So not to say that it can't happen, but just to say that like ideology alone, I think I found is like almost insufficient, right? Um, often insufficient, sometimes yeah. sufficient, but often so. insufficient. Fully agree on that. I think that's an important point, especially um, when, you know, at least I, I don't know about you, engage with folks in the West about Islamism in Pakistan. And I was like, well, look at the 70 plus years history of Pakistan. The people of Pakistan have never elected an Islamist, right? They have been thrust upon right. Pakistanis, but people don't vote for an Islamist ideology. The MMA was perhaps the biggest sort of outlier in all of this. But again, that was during a dictatorship and there were some games being played at that time. Um, so I think people forget, especially in the West, that yes, it's a conservative country, but by and large, that Islamist ideology does not win the votes on election day. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask you about, you obviously mentioned that the Karachi violence was happening at a time of extreme ethnic polarization. Uh, we are living in a moment in Pakistan, much like the rest of the world, where polarization is a major, major issue. Um, in Pakistan, obviously, that polarization now is not ethnic. It's on political lines, PTI on one side, everybody else on the other. The military sort of getting hit on either sides of it, which is also interesting from my perspective. Um, but how do you see this polarization and its impact on the e evolution of political violence in the country? Like... Are you concerned about this? Are you watching for certain indicators? Like, what are you keeping your eyes on to say, you know, what we're, because my view on this has been, it's a very dangerous moment in Pakistan. Yeah. It could go either way. And I would love your thoughts on it as well. Yeah, for sure. I, I would agree with that. Um, I think, you know, there's some lessons from my research and research um, of other of other scholars in, in different contexts, especially in the West of, of, you know, these kind of really negative downstream consequences of political polarization. So, you know, as I just mentioned in Karachi, which wasn't political polarization, really it was ethnic polarization, but often the partisanship overlapped with ethnicity, right? What we had, as I mentioned, was like a captive support base. And what that means really is that your the voter is not holding the party accountable for its acts. And I think that is what we are seeing in, you know, so research um, by scholars in the U.S. has found that um, when it comes to political polarization, what we find is that partisans are really willing to um, put up with undemocratic behavior by their political party. And so there, there's a sense that um, as these scholars from Yale, they write that you know, these, are the, these voters are partisans first and Democrats second. And so this undemocratic behavior, you know, like in, 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 in my research was, uh, again, ethnic polarization was really about um, violence, right? So like they were willing to like be okay at some level with violence because of this, the, 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 the ways in which society in Karachi was structured. And so what we're seeing, I think, um, and what we should, again, what also causes me to worry is that we're seeing that individuals, partisan voters are more okay with undemocratic behavior by their preferred political party. Um, and so they're, they're willing, again, to kind of strengthen um, their political party at the expense of institutional um, or constitutional rights um, and democratic norms. And I think that's a really scary phenomenon, right? And I think we, we saw it in, in the, we're seeing it in the US, but we certainly saw it um, during the 
the, the previous elections under Trump, right? Um, and then even, you know, right now with the no confidence motion, you know, we saw that the way in which people viewed the no confidence motion or the dismissal or dissolution of the National Assembly was really divided along partisan lines. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that worries me about polarization, and this relates to another uh, field of my research, is, which is on misinformation, um, but we find that often, um, you know, whether and how people believe facts is also kind of determined by their partisanship, right? And so, and who is endorsing the conspiracy theory or the misinformation? Um, and so my research, and this was from quite a few years ago, early in my PhD program, was that when conspiracy theories are endorsed by people's preferred political party in Pakistan, which is a place which historically has not had very strong partisan ties, even then that that conspiracy theory is more likely to be believed, right? So this ability of political parties um, in this polarized environment to kind of, you know, uh, manipulate how the public views facts, I think, is, is really is really complicated um, and detrimental. Um, and, you know, Pakistan and other countries, again, not to just say just Pakistan, but since we're talking about Pakistan, it has suffered quite a bit from, um, you know, a disbelief in the official narrative, right, and disbelief in, in all sorts of um, things and narratives. And that makes it difficult because, you know, if you and I can't even agree about what happened, then how are we going to agree about the the effects of this or whether this is okay or not because we don't we're not even operating from the same factual basis right and so this makes forward movement impossible because you're going to say oh well this is you know the orth march is foreign funded and etc cetera, etc cetera. and so it's like we're not even talking about what women's rights are we're talking about a completely different thing now so we don't even agree on the basis um and so this makes i think it really hard for people to get get past um towards some mutual understanding or agreement um because because as it is like the nature of, of facts is being disputed and everything is so polarized um, and complicated. But just a final note on this is like, even though I do think it's detrimental, again, whether or not it translates into voting behavior, I think is an open question, right? And I think I think it's an open question because of the this the weak organizational capacity of the PTI and their reliance on electables, right? And so the fact of what you know, whether or not the next election will definitely go to the PTI because of this sudden this recent swell of support, I think, kind of discounts the fact that in much of the country, we do again see um, patronage, patronage politics like dominating voting behavior. And so that is changing, but whether it's changing quickly enough, I think is is unclear. And so I don't I think we should also, as we discuss this, like not not necessarily equate this conversation necessarily with voting behavior. Yeah, and I think the the electables point is super important because 80% of the PTI's winners in 2018 in the Punjab, roughly 80% were dynasts, right? So they exactly. were the electables that you and I are talking about. And let's even assume that that pattern is changing. Parliamentary democracy in Pakistan is a first past the post system, which means two or three percentage points slipped in your voter margins um, is devastating, right? You lose a ton of seats. You go from 20. 30 something percent of the vote on election day to 26, 25 percent of the vote. And that makes you a terribly weak party across yeah. the country. Right. And I think, again, one of the things that perhaps given democracy in Pakistan has been an experiment in fits and starts, a lot of people, especially younger people who happen to be in Safian, don't recognize how a first past the post system works and how these things you know, lead to a devastating loss, even though you may be thinking, hey, we got a ton of votes. And it's like, well, two percentage points shy and, and you're in third at the end of the day. Right. And I think that's yeah. something we'll see how it plays out. Um, I think another thing um, on, in this post-truth sort of post-fact world that we're living in, particularly in the Pakistani context, is how narratives shift on a dime. Right. So just mm -hmm. two years ago, you and I have been you know, texting each other over the last couple of years about how certain things people say are considered raw funded or CIA funded or anti-army or anti-Pakistan. And now the same people who had been making those points are the ones who are taking those same positions that somebody like a Mohsen Dawar or Ali Wazir was taking. But that's kosher now all of a sudden, even though if you were to just put a quote and say who said it, people would say it was somebody from the PTM and the reaction is totally different now because somebody from the PTI is saying this. And how do we channel that? How does it impact voter right. outcomes and election day outcomes is TBD? Um, which brings me to my last question um, is, you know, you mentioned there are other actors who've used these groups over the years, TLP right now, and we have the Qazi, Qazi Faiziza judgment, the MQM, a case in point during the Musharraf era, et cetera. How do policymakers, particularly civilian policymakers, 
get out of this conundrum, right? Because at the end of the day, as you describe the incentives and the costs, those things may, the incentives may be higher for violence and things like this in the near term. But the long term is always devastating, especially for civilian authority and democracy and standing democracy. So how do we get out of this rut that perhaps Pakistan seems to be stuck in? Yeah, this is a really important question, something I try and tackle a little bit in my um, in the conclusion of my book. And, you know, I think the I think this point that you get at is really important, right? It's, it's like short term gain, but long term harm. Right. And I think what what needs to change in a way is the the ways in which political parties view their time horizons in office. And for that, I am like a strong supporter and like believer in like just letting the parties complete their terms, because I think that the long-term ramifications of that are really important, right? Because if a party knows that they have five years and they have an iterative game that they're going to then contest elections again, then it, it it forms like a different relationship with the voter, right? Um, because um, because it, it knows that it can't just, you know, get through three years and then and then they don't have to worry. And, and then so they're there's no the martyrdom on offer. Exactly. The swell of sympathy support is like huge. Right. And like our history is like, oh, they're back to power because of like the sympathy wave or whatever. And so it really needs to become more performance based. Right. Um, and the other thing that I'm, you know, a strong believer in, I think also is just like the strengthening the party's organizational capacity. So obviously with the MQM, we saw where organizational strength can result in violence. And so that is not the outcome that all of us are looking for, of course, but organizational strength of the political parties kind of allow them to be in charge of their decisions, right? And in charge of like who they put up for a candidate in a particular constituency and not so reliant on who the local actors are and who the local power holders are. Um, and so kind of like strengthening organizational capacity, but towards nonviolent outcomes, right? So we have, um, you know, organizational strength, um, but that is not being used in a way that uh, would be necessarily detrimental. Um, and then the other thing I think is, you know, again, like a, a good, I, I don't think this is ne necessarily bad. And also, I don't, I've said this before, I don't know if I fully, fully believe it, but I think it's something I'm kind of muddling through in my own mind is, even when we talk about all the negative things about polarization, I think what we're seeing when we see polarization also is a strengthening of party voter ties, right? And that is a good thing in a hybrid context, right? Because we want to see political parties um, who have independent ties with, with voters that are about a ideology or policy positions or something that isn't patronage, right? So obviously the current uh, moment right now is potentially dangerous. Um, but I don't think that that means that we need to throw like party voter ties out the window, right? And like, that is also something I think we need to be um, working with, right? Because we want to, we want to see, I mean, Western democracies, stronger democracies, that that's what exists, right? These strong party voter linkages, which allow the voter to hold the party accountable. Um, and so it's removed from patronage systems, right? Or entirely patronage systems where the voter just becomes like the you know, the whoever gives me what I, the material need. Um, so they, they become more reliant on the local patron, um, which which isn't great. So I, I do think that there are some some potentially silver linings of the moment that we're in, um, potentially. So very cautiously, I'm going to say that. Yeah, and I, that last point is interesting. And I, I need to do some more thinking about this. But a quick reaction is also what happened with the MQM again, post Altaf, right, is that some part of the party still held together. The port, yeah. voter party tie remained even when violence was sort of pushed out essentially through an exogenous shock in this instant. Um, but the MKM voter, largely speaking, is still intact, which is why it's still a relevant political actor in Karachi. Yeah. Um, I think the question, for example, that I always ask my Insafian friends about the PTI is that, would you still have that level of support if Imran Khan was gone tomorrow and there would be somebody else? We don't know the answer to it. It's the same question for the Nawaz League, for the People's Party with the Bhuttos. Yeah. Even the TLP with Khadim Hussain Rizvi's passing, with Saad Rizvi, even though he's the son, is still going to have to struggle with that because the father was something else, right? He was out of the ordinary as a political actor. And can the son maintain that tie with the TLP or is there a TLP something else come up? Uh, again, an interesting question that we should yeah. keep an eye out on. But I think, yeah, the strengthening of that voter party tie is important in a fledgling hybrid type democracy like Pakistan, because it also reduces the scope of other actors to sort of do their own shenanigans. And then we talked about exactly. organization, uh, which again will break the old electable ties. Uh, fingers crossed it happens in a nonviolent manner, but we'll see. Um, but 
Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation and again, lots more to chew on. Uh, for those of you tuning in the book uh, and, 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 and the research Dr. Uh, Needlefer is doing, do check that out. But before I let you go, um, I will ask you a question which I ask all my guests, which is what are two or three books that you would recommend to the audience? Good, I was excited for this question. Um, so I um, you know, teach courses on South Asia and uh, violent political conflict, um, terrorism and so on. And so um, I will share three books that I often assign to my students um, that I am a big fan of. So the first is, um, let me get the name right. It is, um, We Crossed a Bridge and It Trembled by Wendy Perlman. And it's about the Syrian civil war. Um, she's a political scientist, uh, but the book is really, um, it's told um, from the perspective of uh, her interviewees. And so it's kind of just oral narratives. Um, and uh, it's the, the time frame is about, I think, 40 years. And so it is absolutely beautiful, super evocative, very important questions about Syria, but like very, very important, um, you know, questions like broadly speaking as well. Um, and I, I really highly recommend it. It's called We Crossed a Bridge and It Trembled by Wendy Perlman. And the second one I really like a lot is No Good Men Among the Living by Anand Gopal. So I don't know if you've read that, but it's about the US uh, war in Afghanistan. It was written a few years ago, but it's still super relevant. Um, and it really just, I think, is really um, sad and maddening in the ways in which the many, many ways in which the war went wrong and just like how, how complete lack of local knowledge and local context was really to blame. And it's really important for us to read, I think, like all over so we don't repeat these mistakes again. But again, incredibly well written, a sad but beautiful read. Um, and then let me see what else I had put down in my notes. Um, oh, I just read recently Bring the War Home of the White Power Movement and Paramilitary America. And I also really recommend that given the current moment we are in the US, um, but also the author Kathleen Billow, she links um, wars abroad with um, what's happening with the white power movement in America. And so I think that's important. I'm just going to plug three books that are forthcoming on Pakistan, which I have had the pleasure of reading before they were published or parts of them. So Yasser Qureshi has a, a new book uh, coming out on the Pakistan judiciary. Um, and Zoha Wasim has a new book coming out on policing in Karachi. And Chris Clary has a new book coming out about, um, or it's just out, I think, at least electronically on the India-Pakistan conflict. So three really excellent and amazing books about um, Pakistan. And I think um, it makes me really excited about the future of scholarship. Um, about our country. So. And three yeah. potential guests for me to interview. There we go, book, exactly. Right? So I'm excited about that. And yeah. on the on the No Good Men Among the Living, it's a fantastic book. And one of the things that I've been, you know, privately griping about with people I know in Pakistan and in, in DC, et cetera, is that this is the fourth sort of imperial war in Afghanistan, right? The first Anglo, the second Anglo, the Soviet invasion, the American. Um, and if you go back beyond that, there was Ranjit Singh, which was the fifth sort of the first before the Anglo Wars. And in Pakistan even, right, the tragedy is that among those five wars that have been fought, the most successful, if you could argue, a successful for a successful war was Ranjit Singh's campaign mm -hmm. with, against the Afghans. And what Ranjit represented and what was going on in that era is a question mark, and you can debate it depending on what side you are on. But fact of the matter is that the Khyber Pass is part of Pakistan because of Ranjit's campaigns, not from the Anglo-Afghan war campaigns. But we don't have scholarship about how and why Ranjit and his right. empire was so successful, right? That was, in my view, at least in the short reading of history I have about that region, um, perhaps the next invader, if there are ever one, hopefully there won't be of Afghanistan, perhaps ought to study Ranjit's campaigns first and then learn from that and then read up all on the other ones and not repeat the same mistakes again. But um, it is really one of the great tragedies of history that this country has experienced war time and time again by outside Definitely. powers who don't learn from the past uh, and Absolutely. who repeat the same mistakes. So thank you for that recommendation in particular as well. And thank you for your time today. This has been a fascinating conversation. Um, and we'll be in touch and, and maybe have you on again soon, maybe perhaps closer to election or after election so we can see what, what the data shows us. Whenever that is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Azir.